Right, so I, <coughs> I was afraid that, that, you know, when I was preparing these slides that all the things I was going to say were going to be talked about uh, during this conference or today, but fortunately I still have a few, uh, few things that haven't been said. And I've decided to focus on one uh, topic, which is urbanization in Africa, and which basically means let's build cities in the countryside. There's still a lot of countryside, and we're going to have a lot more cities. Um, and so uh, the way I've organized my talk, I want to just you know, give you two points of motivations for why I think this is important. And then I want to talk uh, issues of methodology which have to do with the theory and then with uh, the empirical, you know, data, you know, the empirical analysis that's been done to, so, so far. So the first thing, where is the, is this the, yeah. Okay. So the first, the first observation is about population growth. We've been talking, these are, I prepared these numbers uh, for, for a lecture I was giving and it's then for the, is there's no pointer? No, no pointer. Uh, from the, so I collected these data from the UN uh, online database. So these are their pro population projection until the year 2100, so 85 years from now. And uh, this is Asia, which is kind of reaching uh, some level and then de declining. And this is Africa. Okay. Africa is going. Is, uh, it's predicted to go from basically one billion now to four billion by the end of this century. At the same time, China will go down. Japan will go down. Russia will go down. So here are some numbers you get from that uh, website. This is Africa, I just, I just said. It goes from 16% of the world population to 40%. Increases, total increase predicted. This is the middle, the middle, the medium fertility forecast. is 270%. Look at other parts of the world. Asia is, you know, goes up a little bit. Europe goes down, Latin America goes up a little bit, Northern America goes up quite a bit because it takes a lot of immigrants, and then we have o o o Oceania, which is still a very small proportion of the whole. So, very big change over time. Uh, if, you, if you look at individual countries, actually, it's even crazier. For instance, South Africa doesn't grow that much, <coughs> but look at predictions for Nigeria, it goes from one. 180 million now to close to a billion. I don't know where they're going to fit them. Uh, Ethiopia goes to, and so some of the countries we discussed earlier, go to about a quarter of a billion. So big changes, all right? Perhaps in magnifying some of your results. I mean, pretty good based on that. Um, not only that, this population is growing fast, but also is growing, uh, is urbanizing also rather fast. So. This is the urban growth rate, historical growth rate, uh, urbanization growth rate, uh, uh, double the world average recently. And currently, about 40% of Africans live in some kind of urban environment. It's pretty to go by 2030 to 50% and, you know, probably go on from there. So, so that's first observation. Looking at the continent where the population is going to grow up, you know, go up very fast, probably unprecedented levels, really. Um, and then the second observation is, a, is an empirical regularity, uh, which sometimes is referred to as zip flow. Uh, this fellow zip was a linguist, and he plotted the log frequency of a word, uh, the, the frequency that the word is used against the log of the usage rank of that word, and he got, and he gets this kind of linear relationship. And so he gave it, you know, actually not him, but people after him gave, gave his name to that law which is this relationship, and then people have, you know, tried it on other data set, and this is, a, this is one that came out of uh, this AER you know, uh, paper by ECAL in 2004 that plots the log of city size, so, the popu the, so this, this would be basically the log of the population of the largest city, this is for the U.S., and then you put it against their, the log of the rank, so the largest city would have rank one, and so it would go on. And you, and, and, and you plot these two logs against each other, and you get something that's very linear. Okay, so that's that's what referred to as zip flow. Um, now it turns out that you can just if you're gonna nitpick with me, or is it zip flow, or is it Gibraltar's law? Actually, you can say actually, if you include enough of the smaller towns, you actually this thing starts to curve in. So actually, it's not really it's not really zip flow, which is 
actually a Pareto distribution, it's actually more like a log normal distribution if you include all the very small towns. Okay. <laughs> but leak here, not really. This basically <laughs> means whether it's zip or gibrat, what will happen is that as you increase African population, this whole thing is to move that way. So you're going to increase the large cities, but you're also going to have a lot more small cities. Okay. So where are they going to appear? So that's the kind of question I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. You're going to go from 1 billion to 4 billion. Okay, some of them are going to go to big cities, which are going to grow really big. But then where are you going to put the others? And by the way, Africa is really big. I don't know if you realize that, but it's just the United States alone fits into Sahara Desert, for instance. <coughs> This is United yeah. States, China, India, uh, you know, it can fit, fit all of Europe now. So it's really a big place. So it, it's, if it was very small, you would say, well, we're going to put lots of new cities, but it oh, doesn't really matter. I mean, it's a small place. Does it? But actually, in a place like that, you, you say, well, where should we put them? It's actually, it becomes a policy issue. Where do you put the roads? Where do you plan those things? Where do you put infrastructure, the power grids? That's the kind of issues. And also, is there a way of, uh, of organizing this? Is there, is there, are, there, are there planning of, of new cities or, uh, that are more efficient than others? We know the Chinese are now building entire cities you know, uh, from nothing, like flattening some hilltops and just building new, new places where there was nothing before. Um, I don't know whether they thought about what's the optimal organization of space, but that's the kind of question I'm interested in. <laughs> now, so from that perspective, I wanted to say two things, two sets of things, a few things about the theory and a few things about the empirical work. And in a sense, my, my main takeaway point would be that the two don't match. Yeah, currently, they don't really match very well. A little bit with some papers today that really go into the direction that I'm pushing for. So what's the, so I'm, I'm going back to very old theory. Okay, so von Thunen is like more than 100 years ago. But what's interesting about von Thunen is that, so he looks at the world not, from a, not as a collection of points, and as a plane. And he tries to understand how the plane self-organizes. Not only that, when he looks at self-organization of a plane, he considers not just strategic complements, which have been the focus of a lot of the talk we've talked about here. You know, it's good to trade, let's build a road, both places will benefit, hooray. He also talks about strategic substitutes. If you have an undifferentiated plane where people are living in subsistence farms, and suddenly you have a little town that emerges, it will organize, in this case, agricultural production around the town, and you will get something that looks like that where you would get, well, this is a little town that has appeared in medieval uh, Germany. And uh, so then you would have a, a zone which is close <coughs> enough. So, you, what you, what you, and how do you get the, so close enough where you would get dairy farming and market gardening, and you would have some forest for fuel. So this is clearly an old idea it's before uh, you know, modern fuel sources. Then you would have uh, 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 grain and field crops, and then you would have uh, ranching, and finally you get nothing. So how do you get this differentiation over this, uh, this plane purely from differentiated uh, transport costs? So it's just it's more expensive, more costly to move milk than it is to move fuel and so on. So basically, and so that's what I had written here, you get this very simple formula, which only requires one thing that basically the prices in the, in the town are the same irrespective of origin, and so you get, you know, you allow arbitrage unit cost of transportation that vary by, by commodity, and you get self-organization of space, okay? It also means that if the town is there, you can't put another town there. I mean, in terms of agricultural production, that, that's, that's the town that's served by that hinterland. Now, what Kristalla uh, um, central plus place theory does is basically take this idea of, uh, of transport cost and arbitrage and it's not looking at how agricultural production or self organizes <coughs> it looks at how uh, urban production organizes but he also gets uh, predictions that include 
strategic complements and strategic substitutes. Um, so the strategic complements are the agglomeration effects. We've talked about that. I don't really need to discuss them. Um, and so if you get, so if you go get a single town, it might exist because there are agglomeration effects in some sectors, the urban sectors, maybe manufacturing perhaps, perhaps services, okay? Like a rural town, uh, agricultural market, for instance, so there might be some, uh, some uh, uh, trade uh, agglomeration effects because of, uh, in this particular case, just economies of, sc of scope, uh, economies of scale in, uh, in, in exchange. So you will get agglomeration effect that drives the existence of a town, then you get the Wundtun and Hinterland around the town, so you get a circle with a town in the middle. So how, what happens when you have multiple towns? Well, if you let these multiple towns exist, uh, these little medieval towns, what you get is then they, they overlap, and finally they overlap in a way that they are just tightly packed against each other, and they form what, is, uh, what looks like a honeycomb. Okay, you get something that looks like that. One town, it has a hinterland here, but there's another town there where the two hinterland overlap, basically that determines the, the boundary of what is the hinterland of this town, the hinterland of that town. So you get this kind of self organizing concept. Now, of course, there are no roads here, so that's clearly a shortcoming. People are just walking to these towns across the, the terrain, and the, and the terrain is completely undifferentiated, so there are some shortcomings, but there are some interesting features as well. <laughs> because this enables you to think about what if you have different types of goods, different types of urban goods, and these different types of urban goods each have a different transport cost. Okay? So how far do you go for a restaurant meal? I don't know, five miles maybe by, with your car. How far do you go to go to a shopping mall? Okay, maybe 20 miles maximum. Or how far do you go? You know, where is your beer coming from? I don't know, it could come from 250 miles maybe, but not, uh, not a thousand miles and so on. So that's the, but financial centers maybe can serve a very, very large internet. So what happens is that for when you apply this kind of reasoning, what you get, you, you get these overlapping structure. Um, and so you have uh, some small towns that, that have these short reach industries, in, you know, like shopping malls or restaurants, the gas, the gas stations. You have some middle reach industries, maybe more, do more, more manufacturing, the breweries. And then you have a few high, high reach industries Today, it looks like that these are you know, fire, the fire sector, fire insurance, real estate, the really big, uh, highly concentrated industries. Um, and so you get these overlap. <coughs> the model predicts these kind of partially over, come on, these overlapping structures. Okay, of, uh, and this, these structures have a lot of uh, strategy complements, maybe between these styles, but also a lot of strategy substitute effects. There's lots of holes between these towns. Okay? And, 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 but you, have a, you get a hierarchy of, of towns, some, some being apex towns and some being smaller towns. And they typically will also have different sizes. So that's where I'm going with this. I mean, how do you... Okay. Well, that's, that's the... You can refine it by thinking about what are the externalities. Uh, you could have negative externalities. Some, some industries will not go very well together. You could have some positive externalities, maybe they go well together. So that would, you know, add to this model without necessarily completely challenging it. Um, there are things that, so it, it predicts the size distribution of towns and cities. It predicts which industries are most likely to be found in cities of a given size. Uh, if you add these externalities, it predicts things about cities that go well together. It, of course, it also predicts things about migrants. And of course, therefore, as we know from the work presented today, it also makes predictions about income levels. Uh, there are things that are missing. There's no, there are no roads here, but you can imagine. So what happens is that if you introduce roads, you can you can put roads between these towns, and then the, the interlane in between. Um, you have to walk across the terrain or drive on very tiny roads, slower roads. So basically, if you think about it, how you would present this in this framework, is it's no longer a plain. It's a plain that has these little mountains, which are the, the places without roads. Because if you if you're trying to model them as a as a, in terms of a, a time travel, if you think that if you want a, a representation of that in terms of travel time, then you would have to make 
uh, mountains in places where there is no road and therefore where you have to walk around and therefore it's much slower. Okay. So that's a uh, and that's a lot harder to, to run these models on non-Euclidean space. You know, it's, it works very well on Euclidean space. It doesn't work on Euclidean. So can please somebody do that? It would be really nice. Um, it's also static. So it makes it makes an equilibrium prediction, but it doesn't say what happens if population growth uh, grows over time. Okay, so th that's the kind of problem. Uh, uh, all right. Now, quickly, there is recent empirical evidence on this. There's been papers on transport networks, some of them being presented here, and some papers using primary production to try to understand, um, this, you know, try to compare uh, some of some theoretical uh, predictions with empirical uh, observations. This is one example of these papers. It was already cited earlier today. So, it, it, yeah, it's a very interesting paper, a very nice identification strategy, but it doesn't really look at urban growth, for instance. It doesn't look at strategic complements and strategic substitute. There's no sense in which the growth of this place actually might have, because this place was very successful, another place could not be as successful. You know, it's kind of have another city the size of London right next to London. It's not possible. Um, same thing with this paper, also cited earlier. Uh, same thing with this paper. Same thing with the paper that was presented earlier. It isn't uh, the, the paper that Matt presented. It didn't... Um, it told us two places grow up if they are connected, but it doesn't tell us, well, does it happen that if one grows more than a prediction, it means the other one grows less than the prediction? Are the, are the error terms negatively correlated? That would, be, that would be indicative of some kind of a strategy substitute effect. Um, this is another one. Actually, this, this one actually does a better job. This, this paper by Strobe and Burry, my, in my, uh, and, and Morton and Oliver, I have also a paper on that, which I think goes into the direction of, uh, of looking at these uh, effects on urbanization. And then there's another series of well, fewer papers that try to look at, basically use primary production shocks to see whether they, they trigger, so they generate an increase in uh, pr production for primary sector that relies on the land, and then you try to see whether they trigger uh, urbanization, local urbanization. So there's one, um, there's one paper by uh, Remy Jedouab about that, which focuses on cocoa production in, in Ghana and Ivory Coast, and it generates maps like this. So this is density. Uh, so what it shows, it's, it's terrible, this thing. But these are, it's really, uh, uh, yeah, I, can't see here. I don't know why this projector I mean, it looks much better on the screen. Um, so these are towns, and this is cocoa producing area, <coughs> and over time, this cocoa produce producing area shifted. And then what, what happened is that you get a, a shift of, uh, of these, you know, more towns are created, and some of these towns that were created before are no longer really places of intensive uh, cocoa production. And basically what he argues is that these are consumption towns. They become consumption towns. And, and they concentrate a lot of informal sector activity, which is a kind of a, a, a not modern form of uh, small-scale manufacturing and small-scale service provision. So it's like a returns, it, it, it's returns to specialization. You, said that you get people who become a full-time Hairdresser, which you wouldn't find in a completely rural setting. Uh, okay, so I have only one more thing to say. Another kind of historical accident is mining. Uh, we know just from just introspection that you can have uh, big cities that started as uh, gold mines, Johannesburg, big cities that completely the cities that disappeared, and cities that kind of survived as small cities. And uh, so, um, I did some work on gold mining and uh, proto-urbanization. In Ghana, there was a, a kind of a boom in, my, in gold mining or re rebirth of the gold mining sector after liberalization and large increases in gold prices. And uh, so you can study. And what, you f what we find there is that... Um, so we, we basically look at these places. We look at a very fine level of uh, uh, aggregation. We have 10,000 EAs. 
By the way, this, this model I showed you earlier, both the Von Thun and, and the Crystaller Isard models, they massively depend on the level of uh, 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 geographical disaggregation you use. Because okay. the, these results are very, very fine results. They're, 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 they're only observable at fine levels of uh, disaggregation. If you, if you aggregate everything at a, the country level or state level, you don't see any of that stuff. So we looked at, at this at a very fine level of disaggregation, and we focus on uh, shifts in the type of things people do, in the kind of occupations people have. And what we find there is the location, with gold, the location with gold mines, new gold mines, or increased gold mines, have more light life, I mean, which probably means more uh, uh, higher income, and also proportionally higher employment in industry and services, outside mining, of course, and in wage employment. And uh, we also find a kind of a kind of an aggregation uh, uh, telltale sign of that non-farm employment, in fact, decreases at 20 to 30 kilometers from a gold mine. So, and then we also look at uh, things over time, and the, the, probably the more interesting one is what happens when gold production decreases? Does the, the thing go back to where it was? Or do we see some kind of uh, persistent effect of a temporary uh, gold uh, shock? And uh, the results are, you know, we have a 10-year interval, so it's not massively strong. But we, we do find that there is uh, uh, the share of agricultural employment continues to shrink. So it doesn't, it doesn't go back to where it was. But it's also, uh, this seems also to be associated with an increase in informal <coughs> mining. So people coming to exploit the tailings or try to dig for gold in abandoned mines and things like that, which may itself be a temporary, temporary phenomenon. So we, we need to wait a little bit longer and redo this analysis once that uh, perhaps is over. So that's what I, would, what I wanted to say. So, but I think we're not, we, we're getting more prepared after this conference, but still not very well prepared to, to think about the small guy, the small towns. We've talked a lot about cities, but let's talk also about the, the small towns. Thank you. Thank you, Arsene. At the end, I'm going to ask you, so, so, so what's it going to take? <laughs> you know, uh, what? Well, you said we're not well prepared for it. Well, so what's it going to take? So, research-wise. Research-wise. So I, I, I think that the end. It, it will take more, <coughs> a, a better realization that some of the geographical effects we're interested in are not complements. They're also substitutes. And I think this distinction between agglomeration effects that are complements and then these substitution effects, the fact that there's, there's concentration in one place, it has to come from elsewhere. These are, these are so, something really we should focus on. Um, we should put things on a plane people keep working with dots, and it's fine in the U.S. because these cities are there and they don't really change much, but in a place like Africa where the cities, well, of course, lots of new town cities have been emerging over the last hundred years, they, they didn't exist hundred years ago, most of them, uh, and of course in the future they will still continue to, to, to have new cities. So it's not good to just think about, oh, there's these dots and we focus on the cities that exist today, we don't ever look about the, we don't even consider the possibility of new cities. And the final point is about degree of, uh, people should be more, more careful about the degree of uh, uh, magnification. Because if the but when people think that the degree of magnification does not matter, you get exactly the same, it doesn't matter. That is like saying that the world is a fractal. That, you know, it's the same at every level of magnification. Uh, it's not true. I don't think it's true. There are going to be some limits to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to these fractals. Great, thank you. Steve.